Welcome to the Wondrous History Podcast and to the final episode of this current mini-series where we looked at accounts of travelers, merchants, clergymen, diplomats, among others, in the eastern parts of the Mediterranean, mainly in Cyprus, where we looked at accounts from Excepta Cipria. If you are new to the channel, make sure to check the previous episodes of this mini-series, but also other series done on this channel as well. Subscribe if you haven't done so already, it would really help the channel a lot, and let us resume this final bit of this journey. One of the main reasons I've chosen this document is the timing when it was written, 1598-1599, the end of what had been a very turbulent century in most of the Mediterranean, including in Cyprus, Northern Africa, the Levant, Malta. Cyprus saw much turmoil, military and economic. The Fourth Ottoman Venetian War meant that the Venetian Republic had lost one of the, its most important parts of its Stato d'Amar. The account of one Kotovicus is an extensive one, and we can see in the preface given by Cobham, the author of Excepta Cipria, that there's a lot of context to be unpacked. We learn about his journeys, his roles, and how he saw what was, by that point, Ottoman Cyprus at the dawn of what I said before had been a very turbulent century. So the preface begins by saying, quote, Johannes Kotovicus, otherwise Johann van Kotwijk, a doctor of civil and canon law in the University of Utrecht, sailed from Venice August 2nd, 1598, touched at Limassol September 12th, and sailed from Larnaca September 19th for Sidon, Jaffa and Jerusalem. On March 25th, 1599, now a knight of the Holy Sepulchre, he touched again at Larnaca and visited Nicosia and Famagusta. On Palm Sunday, April 4th, he embarked on his return to Venice, which he reached about May 12th. His preface is in the form of a letter of counsel to travelers who would, with equanimity, endure, evade, or overcome the dangers and discomforts, the toils and trials, of the journey to the holy places. He explains how about the feast of Corpus Christi pilgrims began to assemble at Venice. Before Cyprus fell to the Turk, there was at their disposal a regular service of vessels sailing for Jaffa. But now the writer found people going in cargo boats to Alexandretta or Tripoli, Cyprus or Alexandria, and thence to Palestine with less comfort, more delay, and greater cost. The would-be pilgrim is advised first to make his will and arrange his worldly affairs, then to obtain at Venice the license of the papal legate to whom he must prove that he can afford to spend at the very least 100 gold pieces on the journey. His passage to Cyprus will cost him six silver ducats, his monthly board, 10 ducats at the captain's table, six at the chief steward's. The hire of a ship from Cyprus to Jaffa costs 30 to 40 gold sequins to be divided among the passengers. There are sundry fees to be paid for entrance into the church, nine sequins, into the holy sepulchre itself, two more, and so on. The traveler is further advised to take a mattress with a pillow and a pair of sheets, the whole enclosed in a box six feet by three, which will serve him for a bed, four or six shirts without collars, a woolen sailor's cap, socks, handkerchiefs, towels, and two pounds of soap, 20 pounds of the best biscuit, some good wine, cinnamon, ginger, nutmegs, and cloves, with pomegranates, oranges, and lemons, also sugar, and laxative medicine. His garments must be rough and cheap. The least ornament will excite the cupidity of the Syrians. No arms must be carried, and money must be carefully hidden. In Cyprus, he had better arrange for his passage to Jaffa through a consul. He must choose a Syrian or Moorish captain. The Greeks are cheats and hate the Latins. On Turkish soil, he had better call himself an Englishman, Frenchman, or Venetian, not a Spaniard or German. The journey from Jaffa to Jerusalem is performed on asses, without bit or bridle, saddle or stirrups. 
Generally, the pilgrimage must have been most laborious and uncomfortable. The savagery of the sailors, the smells and noises of the ship, the exactions of the natives, and the insolent fanaticisms of Muslim officials, quote, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, end of quote. On all these, the writer touchingly dwells. One is glad that he survived to return to his country and tell us his story. We translate from the Itinerarium Hiero Solimitanum et Syriacum, Auctore Ioane Cotovico, published at Antwerp. Along with the epitaph to Marc Antonio Bragadino, the reader may like to see the inscription on the tablet at Bergamo, which commemorates his fellow hero Astore Balione. The preface ends, but it goes on to quote the aforementioned inscription, which reads, quote, to Astore Balione, a pious man and brave soldier, slain by the wicked swords of a perjured foe, after shedding glory on the defense of Salamis, by his feats of valor, his fellow townsman at Bergamo caused funeral honors to be paid at the altar of St. Joseph, for that, when he was among them as governor, he loved them wondrously, and with them honored the saint. End of quote. So this is somewhat of an homage to Astore Balione, a key military figure for Venice in their attempt to defend Nicosia and Famagusta during the Fourth Ottoman Venetian War. We also previously discussed uh, in Paolo Paruta's account on this, where he noticed that the desperate decision to recall Astore Balione to Nicosia was blocked by the local Famagustan council. I've spoken about this many a time in the one of the first series of the podcast about uh, Venetian Cyprus. So do make sure to visit those episodes along with the episode more recent on Paolo Paruta's account from Excerta Cipria as well. Now we return to the text and we notice that there are many geographical details and descriptions which are not too dissimilar to the ones I've spoken about in previous episodes of this mini-series. So I just wanted to go to his opinions on Cyprus, especially after the 1560s. Now, I've spoken many times and throughout this podcast about the very tense relations between the Greek Orthodox communities in uh, early modern and Venetian Cyprus and the Latin Catholic ones, but also the profound disdain that many of these writers and travelers, especially those of Italian origin, showed towards the Ottomans. And you can see this in full display with a quote which said about Cyprus, quote, Besides the towns I've mentioned, it is said that there are still 850 villages. These were populous enough in old times and rich and prosperous. Now the Turkish tyranny has left them deserted or thinly peopled. The principal are Lapitus, Chilurus, Carpassus, Lefkara, Constantinum, Limnati, Silica, Arnica, Pelendria, Kilani, Colossus, Piscopia, Salins, Conoclia, Orima, Serins, Arzus, Omodus, Crusocus, Solia, Morfu, Limissus, and Lefka. Besides Turks, Moors, and a few Jews, the majority of the inhabitants are Greeks who use the Greek language and written character, their dialect differing somewhat from that of Crete. They are Christians of the Greek rite. There are also Maronites, Nestorians, Jacobites and Copts, fugitives from Palestine, who were driven from the realm of Saladin after the capture of Jerusalem and settled here, each sect still observing its own rites. The Turks, according to the statements of persons worthy of credit, number scarcely 6,000 males, the Christians, always accepting women and children, 28,000. The Cypriots bear the Turkish yoke unwillingly enough, still they bear it, since they have no hope of aid from the princes of Christendom, from whom so great a distance shuts them off. They think, however, that were there any chance of aid, their arms, their courage and numbers would suffice to set them free. But such, alas, is the present deplorable attitude and the temper of the Christian princes such their mental blindness, so fierce the bitterness of their mutual hatreds, so cold their faith and love, that they have no thought 
for the good of all or the cause in which they should be ever vigilant. They allow general confusion to reign. They refuse help to the tottering Christian commonwealth. Christian blood is shed unavenged. Christians draw their swords upon one another when they should be bringing aid to those who groan under the infidel yoke and waging war against their savage foe until they have crushed that impious Turk tyrant and brought his strength to the ground. With daily tears, the wretched Cypriots deplore this state of things and see no hope of liberty unless it should flash upon them from heaven. End of quote. And the writer goes back and forth and we get glimpses and descriptions of what Cyprus used to be under the rule of the Venetian Republic. We have this specific paragraph here which says, quote, Under the last kings and the Venetian Republic, the islanders were divided into six distinct classes, Parici, Lefteri, Perpirari, Albanians, White Venetians, and Nobles. So we get a clear social demographic classification described over here. So as a result, there is a recurring theme uh, and a clear bias of the authors, the, the merchants, the soldiers, the clergymen, the diplomats who wrote many of these documents uh, and their opinions on 16th century Cyprus. There is a clear uh, theme going on here and it's quite obvious in this document from Kotovikus as well. There's a clear element of nostalgia in which many of these individuals long for what was indeed an idealized um, form of Cyprus. Cyprus, un even under Venetian rule, had many problems, which were clear, especially in places like Nicosia and Famagusta, where it was a much stronger Venetian Latin presence. Uh, things might have been better to someone coming from Venice, but that was not the whole uh, picture. And the final pa paragraph uh, in Kotovikus' uh, statement reads the following, quote, The present condition and appearance of the island is far different, oppressed by barbarian rule and stripped of its old grace and glory. Much of it is uncultivated, neglected, deserted. Cities once famous and populous and full of stately buildings are now ruinous, squalid, and thinly peopled. Towns and villages lie desolate and forsaken, for it, for it is the way of the Turks to lay waste city and field to destroy ancient splendor. So much for the description of Cyprus. End of quote. And with this, I'd like to end this current mini-series. I will want to hopefully come back uh, at a later point, maybe discuss about Malta, uh, Candia, or Crete, also different accounts um, which are not just about Cyprus, but other parts of the Mediterranean, maybe the Ionian Islands, the Aegean uh, as a whole. That would be very interesting to explore once I get a bit more time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wanderers History Podcast. I will come back with a first episode wanting to have like a, pre a preface of what I hope to be a new series, but it might just take a bit of time to make that. So thank you again for listening to this. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, all the best. <laughs>